They're stuck. They're stuck. They're stuck. Well, television replaced the hearth. As we know, historically, in the hearth were the household gods. It was a spirit. And in the spirit of the father was the spirit of storytelling, and the spirit of storytelling was in the home and belonged to the people who were in the home and not anyone outside. And then television came in and stole the spirit of storytelling and stole the household gods and destroyed family life more than us gay men. Everyone in television is in complicity. So what we have to do is restore the spirit of storytelling and the far side in the films which we show people. And then, in other words, allow them within their homes to decide what the work is about rather than dictating. I'm trying to do that. It's very complicated and I don't succeed always because economically and structurally most of society and filmmaking is against one doing that. It's very hard, but that's what I try to do, restore home into my movies. If you believe in family, lie, the hearth, and the spirit of storytelling, then you should retire forthwith from your television company. <laughs> <laughs>
parents are very strange, aren't they? I actually really like my parents in many ways. I even like the disaster that they became. There was no revolt in our family because my mother was dying of cancer for the last 18 years of her life. My sister and I behaved immaculately because we didn't want to upset her. My mum, of course, is everyone's mum. My mother was a centre, and I never once saw her when she wasn't smiling. I never saw a shadow cross her face. She always said, the most important thing is that you're happy, Derek. I don't mind what you do as long as you're happy. That is all that concerns me. He was extraordinary, my father. It isn't everyone's. My father was a bomber pilot. He was in the RAF. My father was wrecked by the war. I mean, he became quite psychotic. He had a huge influence on me. He was very admirable in other ways. So my father came to Sebastian, you know, when Barney James said to my father, I bet Force's life was never like this, like, you know, the film, because he was sitting next door. And my father said, on the contrary, he said, it's very accurate, which I thought was rather good, you know, because I wasn't expecting that. I was rather expecting him to be shocked. But they weren't shocked at all by anything. And my mother, when she was very ill with her cancer, came to the opening of Jubilee, which was a riot, which people are leaving and fainting in and saying this film is impossible. And my mother said, that's a marvelously accurate film, Derek. It's wonderful, you know, and I, it makes me laugh now when I think of this sort of uh, middle-class lady in a wheelchair with her shawl on, sitting through Jubilee, not batting an eyelid and analyzing it with me afterwards. And then I, and I think about that and I think about people like Winston Churchill <laughs> going mad about this film because, of course, the film was the tradition. Uh, my parents understood this. Uh, Winston Churchill are, and that gang, you know, those gangsters in Parliament are against all of this, you know. They're, they're exactly, you know, one's father fought for the welfare state in a way. That's what they were all fighting for. And these people are dismantling it. So I represent the tradition and these people are the wreckers. It's as simple as that, and so they doubly hate it. And, I, and in an odd sort of way, I, I feel I can unmask that. I mean, I think it's very, very nice to be invited. I mean, certainly no one in Great Britain would invite me to do an opera. Can you imagine me being invited to do an opera at the Opera House? It's quite amazing that one has to always come to Italy or, or go abroad to have any imagination and commissioning. I mean, Italy has always been there. It's really my second home. I've never really felt totally as if I belonged in, in Great Britain. I used to hitchhike here when I was a student from London, particularly during my Easter holidays, because there used to be time to get to Rome and then come back, and I always used to stop off in Florence. I was a really hardened um, uh, art student at the time, so I came here to look at all the, the monuments and paintings. There are wonderful, wonderful things here, but I mean, uh, things are destroyed by the vacuous stare, and the vacuous gaze. They, they are sapped of life and energy, and a lot of what you see seems to have died. Yes, effectively, they're crumbling, as I said, in this overexposure. I mean, how can you look at Michelangelo's David when you see 30,000 plastic versions? It's a sort of, it's not really possible. And this is what Pasolini was about, how, how uh, consumerism is destroying all the old values of Italian life. And it, of course, it wasn't just Italy, it was everywhere that where this reached, the Coca-Cola culture. It's an opera about opera making, and it's also to do with Silvano Buzzotti's life. He's Florentine, and uh, so it's very much an opera of the city, and I've tried to make it an opera of the city. Right, OK, well, we'll just leave that there. How are we going to Brad do this scene? I, I have a very divided feeling about opera. I had such a horrible time doing Don Giovanni for the English National Opera. I nearly closed the place down. On the other hand, I've gone to the opera that I really enjoy. The nice thing about Silvano's score is, of course, he undermines his own effort by having a commentator. It was a fact played by Tilda, 
as a sort of goddess who undermines the whole idea of opera. She says, oh, well, this is another typical little opera story we've got here, rather boring on our hands tonight, you know? She's always been, and I like that about it. I thought this is very nice that he should write this sort of opera which is about the problems of opera construction, yet at the same time also be very critical of it within the same work. I think that's a valuable thing to do. The opera was made like one of my films, <laughs> and I decided I'd try and make a head and tail of it. In other words, I try and do what I presume the audience would do when they were watching my films try and work the narrative out as they go. So I, 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 I did this for Silvano in the opera, with perhaps greater or lesser success. Cut. I was always a painter. I never began. When I got to the Slade, it, all the rage was America. And the American dream had really taken over. I mean, there was nothing more wonderful than Andy Warhol's Brillo pads because the vacuity of Andy Warhol actually mirrors the vacuity of American culture perfectly. And therefore, he's the greatest uh, mirror of America in a way. Uh, but one wasn't part of that. One was in a revolt. I wasn't seduced by it. I was interested in something else and I didn't know what it was particularly. Partly because of my own real problems coming in terms of my sexuality. I didn't know who to put or how to put people into this canvas. I found also that all one's weaknesses were one's great help. It was a great uh, advantage in 1960 to be gay. I mean, when one had discovered it. I mean, it was a grueling... Uh, uh, until I was 22, my life was grueling. It was absolutely suicide. It was when I met uh, David and that group of artists who were one step ahead of me, slightly older, that everything sort of changed. And of course, I found myself with an instant uh, group of friends uh, and also in, another, in, a, in a world which was very interesting because it cut across social barriers. In 19... 67, I exhibited some paintings which Nigel Gosling, who was then critic of The Observer, wrote about. And then in the autumn, I, I showed uh, some stage designs, maquette for some stage designs for Prokofiev's Prodigal Son in Paris at the Biennale des Jeunes. And they were written about by Guy Brett. Now, Nigel Gosling introduced me to Frederick Ashton. He said to me, would you like to design this ballet? And I said, well, it'll be wonderful. And he said, well, I can't just give it to you because I don't know how you would do it. But if you, here's the music, go away and bring something back and we'll work from it. And it was from that moment it, it took off because he was the most marvelous teacher. And later on in that year, John Gild asked me to do the, the Don Giovanni, which was a disaster. Don Giovanni was such a slap in the face, it went so badly, I went back, back to my little quiet studio and um, I thought I must find my uh, roots again and I must find out what I'm really about. 1967, 68 was my flirtation with what one would call the establishment. Art is the attrition between the private and public world. I 
think all artists are very aware of all of those responsibilities. And if the artist is not aware of this, then the art will be no good. It might be seen to be of interest for a little while, but it'll soon become unfashionable. There was only one Van Gogh in, with one chair and one sunny afternoon in one room. There was only one vase of sunflowers because after that, it's gone. And that's what art is about. It's about capturing a moment as well. It's about the sort of moment in eternity. The painting remains the painting. The painting remains even then a great criticism of our society. I mean, there can't be anyone who isn't slightly appalled that actually a small piece of canvas is now sold for 25 million pounds in a world where there are many, many people who are, you know, uh, not going to be able to buy their supper this evening. It's just an indictment of our time. It's not an indictment of the irises. The irises are there for everyone to enjoy. You see, this was the most startling image that I saw this year, which is um, the, one of the Dura paintings which an elderly gentleman threw acid at in, uh, in the gallery in Munich. And it became actually one of the most startling images uh, that I've seen this year, and I know now they're going to be desperately restoring this painting. But I think everything has a time and a place, and I think that if this painting enters, was to end its days as a painting with these lines of the acid, all over them, that it should actually be left like that. Because I think it's, it says a, it's, it's a, sh a shocking in, indictment of, of mortality, of, 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 you know, of the trances of things, in fact. As we were talking, in the, in the world where Van Gogh's cost 25 million pounds, and, and he decided that he was going to take it out on a painting. So he did. Catholic no longer fights with Protestant. We have survived, and we owe our survival to the wisdom and to the humanity of one man, George de Saint-Marc. For it was he who prevailed upon all faiths alike to keep the peace. And now our friend has been killed by the plague. Who cares a fuck about scene design? You know what I mean? You know, it's, all it is is like Fortnum and Mason's rapping in, its, in the way it's done nowadays. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Russell was a marvellous person to meet in 1970 to do the levels with because he, he gave me an immense amount of reason and at the same time, he was extremely strict. And I learned, although I didn't realize at the time that I was learning, I learned an awful lot uh, uh, from, from him. Not only of what to do, but also what not to do if I was going to make smaller films than he was making, which was obviously the way I, path I was going to take. I knew that from the beginning. Back in 1970, when, when Ken asked me to design The, the Devils, a, a student from uh, the design school, actually, at Sadler's Wells, was sent to me in America, and he bought a Super 8 camera because he was recording his holiday in Europe and uh, his work here. And, uh, and I started to use it during that summer. It was as simple as that. I made a film of my home. It started as home movies. And I liked it so much, I went on from there. I mean, the Super 8s are just Super 8s like anyone else's. I mean, uh, the, the, the only interesting thing about my Super 8s uh, was that I was filming a particular milieu of artists and things in London during the 70s. And obviously there were people who were involved in image making in one way or another and they were very critical and, and, and it came to the attention of, of other people who made films, as it were, you know, that I was making these images. They were never, you know, I never expected to end up making, being a feature film director. I, not until, I mean, it was completely coincidental. All the methods of communication are the same. For the person who's communicating, they are different. The differentiation is perceived outside. So I'm the same person who paints as I make film. And the same ideas are going through my mind when I'm painting as I'm making a film. It's just that the physical thing of doing them are different. And one I can do very easily by myself, and the other one needs money and other people around.
the images of gay sexuality are usually rather violent because of all the repressed anger that is there. It's quite difficult to actually produce images like those which are quite gentle in, in the angelic conversation. It's very difficult to grow up when absolutely everything one uh, is told about oneself is negative and when one expects sort of eternal damnation, literally, even when the church can't come to terms with it. And so angelic conversation is an antidote, it's sort of a more positive and gentle image of, you know, a whole section of society who a lot of people perceive as, as really you know, beyond the pale. I find year by year that, uh, you know, one is living in a more, un, you know, uh, unspeakable situation, which is something which is only per perceived by gay people. And, it, and because it's an emotional thing as well as just physical. It is physical now with the advent of AIDS as well. There's a generation of young men who really can't make love to each other any longer either. Do you know what I mean? So they're, they're, there's almost a sort of enforced celibacy. It's extremely uh, complicated. And of course this energy is, I know, going to go into, you know, self-violence or violence of some sort. It's very sad. And 29 encourages it. It's a, it's a clause to, you know, to kill people. In England, a lot has changed, but then, then nothing has changed, because it was always like that in England. It only needed someone like Margaret Thatcher to wheel out the forces of repression. They were always there. I mean, it's not something she invented, it's just something she encouraged. It represents absolutely the worst in British tradition and British history, and it's been brought into the centre and encouraged. There is absolutely nothing in Margaret Thatcher which is patriotic, intelligent or honourable. It seems to me to be creaking. Socially, maybe not economically, maybe Margaret Thatcher has a brand of capitalism is going to make more money for everyone. But that's not the point. Socially it's creaking. I, I really think it's time to end it all. I mean, politely, I don't believe in revolution. I find it quite ludicrous. I'm certain the Queen agrees with me. She looks desperate these days. I haven't seen a smile for years. You lead your life as if it was as normal as possible and you see all this aggression being directed against you. So the Angelic Conversation is a, is a film for, really for an audience who would perceive that. Yes, that's the Angelic Conversation. And I put the Shakespeare sonnets, of course. I bought the Shakespeare sonnets into it because they are the perceptive poems and poetry about love is Shakespeare's poetry, which is directed to a young man. And so the greatest love poetry in the world is homosexual. And I think we should remember that. Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed. The dear repose for limbs with travel tired. But then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when body's work's expired. For then my thoughts from far where I abide intend a zealous pilgrimage to thee and keep my drooping eyelids open wide looking on darkness which the blind do see. Sebastian was a sort of mishmash. James, the producer, wanted me to make what he described as an oil and vanilla movie of boys working out with, you know, taut muscles. Paul Humphreys, who was the editor, wanted to change the whole thing into an extremely serious art movie, so he didn't want any of that sort of sexuality in his tool. And I held a balance in between. Why was it Well, simply the script was too, too atrocious, Lawrence. 
400 words. In any case, and we couldn't afford Roman costumes, so the only way to make it a Latin film was to actually uh, put it into Latin, isn't it? I think the language is the most powerful thing, it, you know. So it's a perfect way of making it people roam them. Comitite, comitite, Bergen is bestiales, that versus Moliere, Sabina. Hey, Rotten Colora, it's like Claro. Hey, come to Salina. Well, hey, yes, sir, but hey. It's Basil, it's Christian, he's the first Christian. It's negative, the Sebastian image in my film. Very few people notice that. But the whole point was that this guy, the Sebastian figure, rejected the advance of the guard's commander and ended up suffering for it. And it seems to me that that is the negative aspects of Christianity have led to all of this sort of suffering, this unpleasant sort of role of the martyr, you know, as a, as a figure to be admired. I don't admire these people. What's the point of getting torn to pieces by the lions in the arena? There's nothing admirable in the martyrs at all. They're misguided. I and mean, I think one has to make a very different, uh, a, a, a very clear differentiation between Christianism and Christianity. I'm, as a gay man, of course, I'm uh, consider myself outside the pale. I mean, one's been outside the pale in the interpretation of Christianity, Leviticus particularly, since the 12th century, when the particular witch hunt began and has continued to this day. Uh, I therefore view uh, Christianity as, uh, as the enemy, really, as something I'd actually prefer to see disappear. I mean, in a sense, one was outside the, the whole structure by, uh, as, a, as, a, as a gay man. One was, one was one of the heretics, one of the heathens, and, the, and one was proceeding against like this in the way that Christianity would wipe out whole civilizations. It's not at all the gospel of love and peace. It's a gospel of aggression. You know. Look at it in the hands of Margaret Thatcher, you know, quoting St. Francis in the Falklands. The church's role in, in Great Britain in the last few months where gay people are, are concerned is nothing to do with Christianity. It's everything to do with the secular role that it really is. It's a secular religion. There's nothing there to do with the gospels. Everyone wants comfort. I mean, they lead lives of illusion. They surround themselves with cosy materialism now, in a way, little domestic situations, televisions and things, to blot out the enormity of that void. Outside this blue sky is an infinite void, black. This is an illusion. the king's ship. And I think it's wonderful and the poetry is there and the moments they're flashes of sort of that I can and I like unfathomable things. That's why I like the night better than daylight I think. I spent all my time being nocturnal you know well as a gay man you were sort of cruising around in the middle of the night and it was fabulous. No, not one spiritual command. Bob Shabba! Do you the Tempest? It's alchemy that's the reason it was the it's the chemical, it's not chemical uh, conjunction, it's the conjunction of light and matter. And uh, I, that interests me, I mean, uh, it, it, that's in its structure. why the tempest should be that, but it's an area like that, it's, 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 to me it's obscure, I mean, just what is the island? 
I like the island. I mean, the island perhaps was again a metaphor for gay sexuality. It was a, you know, it was something which was cut off from the world because Prosper actually eventually actually returns to the world, as you know. But it all takes place on this magic island. And the magic island is extremely shifting. It's like sandbars that shift. You know, each time the tide goes, is there an island there? Is there not an island there? Is it an island of sounds and sweet airs? Is it an island of, which is vicious and attacks people? My Trixie spirit. Oh, how beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Life is bad. Gloom and misery everywhere. Stormy weather. Just can't get my poor together I'm weary all the time the time and, I, and the last speech is wonderful where such stuff as dreams are made on and I like that because I never believed in reality because if reality was the way it was served up to us who wanted it? If he stays away Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits, and are melted into air, into thin air. We oh, hear such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Caravaggio, oh, a great artist, a great religious artist who was homosexual. And it's always a problem because obviously homosexuals, in at least the Christian tradition, are absolutely in, in head-on collision, particularly at the moment. There's no way that a self-respecting homosexual can really come to terms with the Christian tradition. I mean, Caravaggio would have painted, say it was the 60s, he would have painted Christine Keeler as the Mary Magdalene and put her up above the high altar piece of St. Paul. He would have literally have done that. The interesting thing was he's interpreting those, uh, the Bible not as uh, sort of mythic, but as a reality. So, you know, the Mary Magdalene is a prostitute who's asleep, you know, on a chair and she's scattered her jewellery off, she's rejected it. This is, this is his approach. It's the only approach. And it's the, just the approach that actually organised religion doesn't have. I mean, it can't afford to. It talks and, you know, it embraces the prostitutes, you know, in the, in the background, but it doesn't bring them forward and put them on the altars, which is what it should do. And that's what it was all about. <laughs> and an art object. Very, very sensitive. Grab your wallet. Like that. Fall back on the bed. I'm an Englishman. I'm an art object. And very, very expensive. You've had your money's worth. 73, take two. You've had your money's worth. Caravaggio is an exercise. It's an exercise in artistic perfection, attempt. Of course, all of those exercises fail, but it's, a, it's an exercise into how to design a film, how to construct a film in a classical manner, within the classical framework. It's an exercise. It's not repeatable, 
Caravaggio is a beautifully designed film. I know because I've been a designer and I know with how meticulous the design in Caravaggio is. The design was integrated totally into uh, the work and every single object on the set was discussed because we were in set. Objects have their own life. They are alive until they are killed. They have to consider them as participants in the scene, living participants in the scene. I wanted to Caravaggio to explore how an artist, a visual artist, works. I've never seen that in the cinema. It's never been done. There's not a film about a painter. There may be some underground thing somewhere I haven't seen, or some documentary, which is very good. But it's a feature film. There is no feature film about painting. Caravaggio is the only one that actually gets in to what it is like to be a painter. And it goes right the way against Caravaggio's life. It should be, you know, a sex, you know, one of these things, you know, by Hugh Hefner. You know, first film about a painter is Caravaggio. Look, look, alone again, down into the back of the skull, imagining and dreaming, and beyond the edge of the frame, darkness, the black night invading, black in the night, silent as an echo, a moat in your eyes. You blink and send me spinning, swallowed in the vortex, I shoot through the violet depths, I love you more than my eyes. It's horribly perverted. Placed high on the altars of Rome in mockery. Damn Casio! <laughs> Sleep on evil like a bird on the wing. Onward the sailors cry. So the last of England is about England. It's about the state, of, but it's sort of the imperial state. It deals with, it deals with institutions, with destitution, with empire, with the past, with family, with bourgeois family life. It deals, it's absolutely, it's completely literate. But the language might be complicated. But I can assure you that I, if, if, if I was actually put against this wall and told to explain frame by frame what I was doing, you, you'd be surprised how coherent it is. The oaks died this year. On every green hill, mourners stand and weep for the last of England. The last of England is a love story with England. It's not an attack. It's an attack on those things that I perceive, perceive at least personally, I perceive as without, you know, things without value, things that have invaded the mainstream of British life. That's not an attack on England, it's the opposite. Gathered everything you threw out of your dream houses, treasured your trash cans, picking through the tatters of your lives, we jumbled the lot and squatted your burnt out hearths. Your world, beavering away at its own destruction, serviced the profit machine and creaked to a halt, not with a bang. I don't need to make a statement in the movies. The movies are a statement. That's the whole point. I'm not interested in political statements. I'm, act I'm interested in the structure of how one makes these sort of films. That is the political statement. There's nothing in The Last of England if you see nothing. And thank God, a film, 90 minutes, with nothing in it. If you want to see something in it, there's something there. I refuse to give it away. I know what I felt, but that's not important. The viewer is the important thing. It's their decision. It's their thoughts. So they, we, if they come with nothing, they'll see nothing. They have to come with something. Yeah, it does represent a sort of new kind of cinema because nothing's been done that way. Whether anyone does it again is another matter. But I mean, the actual way the film is structured and the methods by which it's made have not been done before. So it does represent a sort of a new area of cinema. And a lot of people did think it was, or do think it is a new form of cinema, because it, it actually makes the first rapprochement with a feature film, with video, which goes beyond just trying to make video look like film. It could go much, much further. I mean, it's only a tentative, hesitant step. I mean, even I could go much further.
there's this um, book. I can't remember who made, wrote it, called Adam's House in the Garden of Paradise, which is about the concept of home, which is that every single house that has been built since then, in some way or another, attempts to get back to the original exemplar. And it was particularly about wooden houses, of course, because one presumes that the tree of knowledge was cut down to build a house. And I think that Dungeness, in a certain way, is that, it being a wooden house. And sometimes I think that it's actually very, very like the Wizard of Oz, the house, particularly in the hurricane last year, because one expected it to take off and blow away like the little house in Kansas and that the nuclear power station is, in fact, the Emerald City. And I think that that is... I think that's a, a feeling I have done here, really. It's odd, but I've invested a whole mythology with this landscape already of my own. Well, it's the perfect place to work because I have the sea a couple of hundred yards away from the, the door. I, there's no wall around the house, so you feel a sort of freedom which you don't get in most houses in the country where there's a sort of defined space. There's no defined space, you're out in the landscape and you can walk for about a mile or so in most directions. And I mean, it's given me the feeling that I should actually give up work. I'm very happy doing nothing. I mean, it's slightly like the old man and the sea. You feel here yeah, that all of these things are really, really rather transitory and not all that important. Even recording things like this become sort of outside this sort of ambience and, and there's very very rarely people on the beach so I trudge up and down the beach beach combing. There was suddenly a query over my health you know as to whether I'd actually be insurable to make films and and, and whether I'd actually have the, you know the stamina to make them in fact I'm perfectly all right I'm, I feel better at the moment than I felt for years but I mean who's to tell you see so so I thought well the most sensible thing would be to start painting again, okay? because all you need is yourself, and while you've got the energy to pick up a paintbrush, you're okay, aren't you? Well. So I started to paint, sort of necessity, uh, or whatever. You, what is it that one? These are paintings constructed with a hammer. <laughs> So I've been making a whole series of objects out of things that have been uh, thrown up by the sea. And there are, of course, some fantastic stones on that beach, so, and, and those are incorporated into them, as well as the wood. Uh, and then the paintings themselves, which are another whole area, which, are, which, as you know, are painted on small canvases, with black oil paint, and then the glass is smashed on them, and then there are, there are actually reflections of the sort of things I've been saying here on the painting. They're sort of meditative. They're almost like... They do almost have a, the quality of icons. They are icons for some other purpose. They do have a sort of votive quality about them. So you could say the were religious paintings, Philip, if you wanted to. Although I deny being a religious painter, really, I rather like them. At least I like them enough to hang them up. And when I was painting before, I used to hate my paintings enough to want to take them down as quickly as possible. I never had any of them hanging around at all. But since I started to paint these, I really rather like them, so I have them in my room. In fact, the whole house has got these um, pictures in them. And the cans. The cans are the most marvellous colours, and this is a knife I found which I gilded. I found that, I don't know what that is, part of a signal's light or something like that. I found that on the marshes. These came from Florence, these nails. I found those in the market. I can glue those on. I think it's quite nice like that, with just such a frame. Right, here's another one, right? Right, um, you see, they asked me whether to, uh, you, what, what I thought about Clause 28. Well, this is one of them. I did lots and lots of paintings. This is a Clause 28 painting. Mother of the three, evil to him who evil thinks. That's on his Swaki Malipons, that's the Prince of Wales' motto. 
This is classical world, which was a good deal freer than ours and a good deal more intelligent. In Plato's Symposium, I and Plato said quite simply, unless young men loved each other, then they weren't fit for public office, which I think is very interesting. That was spun in the face of Margaret Thatcher. This is surely Margaret Thatcher. And this is her cabinet, anyone you like. Do you know what I mean? Mr. Hurd, any of the other sort of meanies and beasties that rule us at the moment. That's, of course, 28. I have to say, and I'm going to take this right into the camera now, that Clause 28 is a direct attack on the family, which is the irony of everything, simply because the 10% of people who grow up gay are all born into families, so that any young heterosexual couple could end up with a gay daughter or son, and therefore it is a direct attack on every single young married couple's potential future, at least those 10%, who we don't know who they're going to be, who have a gay son and daughter. And this is the irony of the clause. It is, of course, completely indefensible, you know, and so one knew one was dealing with criminal elements, finally. And this government is criminal. And that was a terrible awakening for me to realise that, that, you know, this is a criminal government. What does one do? In the Lords, of course, I think it was Lord Hutchinson said, we're not dealing with a democratic government any longer, we're dealing with an authoritarian government. And when you hear an old elderly and very famous QC saying that sort of thing, a man of great measure, you realise that those people who shouted fascist had some uh, common sense on their side. And it's absolutely certain that at any moment, if you look at authoritarian regimes, that one of the first things they attack are minorities, either racial minorities or sexual minorities, whenever you're heading to a more oppressive climate. And this is exactly what's been happening in this country over the last 10 years. And there we are. Mm. That is all, that's all to say about the situation. I mean, and that's it. It's all to say, that's all one can say about the clause. The virus saps. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, it crosses out, cancels. You feel apart, so far apart. The others are playing elections, composing the tunes. Are they yours any longer? You watch the argument from a distance, so near, but yet so far. Was it about anything? Nothing? Something? I'm not sure. Why don't you tell me? But if you asked me, was it worth it, I'd say yes. Good night, thank you. Thank you very much for your borrowed time. My perceptions have altered a lot since I wrote it, which was a year or so ago. I actually think that all the negatives that are actually expressed in this poem are actually pluses. Clause 29, I think, is extremely affirmative. And it's actually one of the most affirmative things in my life because it's made me absolutely rethink everything and in, I think in a very constructive way. Don't think that life was that serious, or as serious as the programme might seem to make it. We actually had a wonderful time, and uh, we danced pretty well every night, and I personally wouldn't go back or change anything that happened to me, including that night, whichever night it was, that I actually got the virus. I wouldn't change it. I would leave that intact. I think it's um, part of a given. You can say I'm a fatalist, if you want to. I think that it was actually a good thing to happen to me. There you are. I just want to put the other side of the coin in for you. Because it's too easy to play this game of sort of leper, you know? And it's ridiculous. I mean, there's nothing. I mean, I have, and then coming back to what you were saying, thing, I must say that I managed to do everything I wanted to do with my life and more. And it's actually been completely blessed. And I can't think of anything nicer than sort of sitting down at this house at the moment. I mean, for me, this is perfectly, uh, you know, this is heaven on earth, <laughs> including the nuclear power station, just to remind us that all of that's going on. I would like to think that that one would end uh, one's life as an artist in complete silence. I think silence is the best.
to do nothing nowadays. And do it creatively.